I like trains. I like riding trains. I like watching trains. My favorite commutes have been by train. I like model trains. I watch videos about trains. I listen to podcasts about trains. Because as we've established, <laughs> uh, train good and car bad. One of the reasons I named this channel Not Just Bikes is because I think everyone talks so much about bicycles in the Netherlands, but they don't talk enough about the great train network. I definitely want to do several future videos about trains in the Netherlands, especially now that the coronavirus regulations have been relaxed. Because the trains here are pretty great and, yeah, I like trains. So it's funny that I come from Canada, a country that has absolutely terrible trains. So before I start making videos about trains in the Netherlands, let me tell you about taking the train in Canada. Now before I start, I'm going to be clear that I won't be talking about all of Canada. Although trains are terrible pretty much everywhere in Canada, I will be focusing on the area known as the Quebec City Windsor Corridor, from here on just referred to as the Corridor. I'm doing this for two reasons. One is because it's the region I'm most familiar with, but two, because every time I mention transportation in Canada, some idiot comes along and says, It has to be that way because Canada is 80 bajillion square kilometers with a population density of six, so trains could never work. Look, nobody is traveling from Iqaluit to Flin Flon, and most of Canada is totally empty. That doesn't change the fact that more than half the population of the whole country lives along this little strip. So here's what it's like to travel by intercity train where I'm from, on the nationalized passenger railway, Via Rail. First, you're asked to get to the train station at least 30 minutes before departure of your train. That gives staff time to check your tickets and weigh your bags before getting on the train. Yeah, seriously, they weigh your damn bags for a train. Then you go up to the waiting area because I guess Canadians can't be trusted to wait in the platform like normal people. When your train arrives, everybody lines up to board and business class passengers board first. The only thing they're missing is security and a duty-free shop and then Canada will have perfected the art of making domestic train travel just as painful as airplane travel while taking twice as long as driving. The locomotives themselves are pretty old and every passenger train in Canada is diesel. There used to be electric trains but the last of them were taken out of service in the 1960s. The theoretical top speed is typically 160 kilometers an hour, but for reasons I'll get into later, you'll almost never go that fast. A game I like to play when taking the train in Canada is to look up the number of my train car to see how old it is. How old do you think this car is? Take a guess. Wrong. It was built in 1947. Though I will say, these stainless steel Bud Car Company cars really were built to last forever. They don't make them like they used to. Now, obviously, these train cars have been refurbished, and to be honest, they're not completely terrible inside. They have pretty comfortable seats, free Wi-Fi, and there's a meal service. And it's important to be comfortable, because not only are you going to move very slowly, you're probably going to arrive late, and here's why. Canada used to have an extensive passenger train network, but after World War II, the government started investing heavily in automobile infrastructure, and the privately run passenger train companies could not compete with a heavily subsidized highway network. The largest private rail operator, Canadian Pacific, wanted to get out of the passenger train business completely, but the government wouldn't let them. Eventually, this resulted in the Canadian government nationalizing the rotted husk of what was left of CP's passenger rail network, which they called Via Rail, and that's what we're left with today. Unfortunately, Via Rail did not own any trackage and needed to pay freight rail companies to use their tracks. That means that Canada is one of the few developed countries in the world where passenger trains need to yield to freight trains and not the other way around. In practice, this means that even a slight change to any passenger train or freight train schedule means delays of several hours for passenger trains. But hey, you can enjoy watching a two kilometer long freight train pass by while you wait. I'm uh, not actually gonna make you wait for the whole two kilometers. This isn't like my paint drying joke. But let's talk about schedule. The train I take most often is Toronto to London, which is a fairly major route. 
As you can see, there are only seven trains per day, including a milk run that takes three and a half hours. This is about a two, maybe two and a half hour drive door to door, depending on traffic. There's been a lot of talk about building high speed rail, especially between Toronto and London, the most populated part of the corridor. But these plans come and go depending on which political party is in power. But as nice as it would be to get from Toronto to London in just over an hour, many transportation experts believe that what is really necessary is more frequent trains, at least every 30 minutes. Because it's pretty hard to make any serious travel plans around seven trains per day. Unfortunately though, regardless of whether the train runs faster or more often, there's another fundamental issue with taking the train in Canada. In the vast majority of the cities, when you do arrive at your destination, there's nowhere to go. Public transportation is nearly useless, and many Canadian downtowns are hollowed out from decades of neglect and car-centric policies. This is what you're greeted with when arriving in my hometown by train. Half-empty buildings and surface parking lots. So if you're going to need a car to get to where you're going anyway, why bother taking the train at all? Of course, I still take the train because I'm a train-loving masochist, but it's very clear that the typical Via Rail traveler is either a rail fan or a student. Unfortunately, as you can imagine, the solutions are not very easy. Via Rail has plans to buy and build their own track in the corridor, but in the meantime their on-time performance has been decreasing every year due to an increase in freight rail traffic. Fortunately, the ancient fleet is finally due for renewal and will be replaced with more modern Siemens locomotives and passenger cars over the next two years. But the problem of last mile transportation is a more difficult one to solve, because it will require a fundamental rethink of the suburbanization of Canadian cities. This may be inevitable due to financial issues that I'll talk about in future videos, but it's going to take a long time to repair the damage. And until then, unless you're going between those rare cities that have functional public transit, basically Montreal and Toronto, then the train is going to be a painful option for the foreseeable future. There's hope yet for future trains that are not completely terrible, at least in the greater Toronto area, but I'll save that for part two of this video. For now, I'm just so thankful to live in a country with a functional train network. It may not be the best in the world, but it's still pretty great, and I will never ever take it for granted. I want to take this moment to thank my Patreon supporters who pay me to complain about trains. If you'd like to support the channel too, visit patreon.com slash notjustbikes. And now that trains are open again to non-essential travel, which Dutch city do you think I should visit first? Let me know in the comments.